And Dr. Collins joins me now. Dr. Collins, thank you for everything you have done for this nation and for the time that you've taken to explain it all to us. And I know that you are a presidential appointee and you can't comment on all the stuff I just said. Um, but I, I do want to ask you, now that we're on the other side, or at least it feels like we're getting to the other side of this, before I discuss vaccines with you, um, what, what do you think about how we, we got through this and what would you have done differently uh, knowing what you know today? Well, Ali, thanks. It's nice to be back with you on your show. You always do such a good job of getting the facts out there for people. Looking back, I think we underestimated the vaccine hesitancy issue. We were so totally devoted to trying to get the best science brought forward to make these vaccines happen and to make sure they were safe and effective. And that outstripped our expectations. And just 11 months having vaccines that met the highest possible standards for emergency use and yes, then the big push was get them out there, get them into people's arms. And yeah, surely people will come around. Yeah, some people are a little skeptical, but as they begin to see the benefits, uh, we won't really run into that much resistance, will we? <laughs> well, here we are today, 66 million Americans still have yet to get that first injection. And today we are losing about uh, 1,500 people to COVID-19 deaths. That's like you know, five jumbo jets crashing every day and all for the most part preventable because almost yeah. all of these are unvaccinated people. I wish we had somehow seen that coming and come up with some kind of a myth buster approach uh, to try to block all of the misinformation and disinformation that's gotten out there all tangled up with politics and which is costing lives. Uh, I agree with you. You and I were talking in December, or January in the uh, the the vaccine came out and I was thinking to myself, there's no way not everybody's going to go for this. I mean, people like me were pressing refresh to get appointments to get the vaccine. So I think you're right. We all uh, misinterpreted that one a little bit. Let's talk about Johnson & Johnson. They're talking about a, uh, a booster for this. Some of the FDA panel folks expressed a concern that maybe this was mismarketed. Maybe the J&J &J vaccine was always supposed to be a two-dose vaccine. And people I've spoken to have said most vaccines are multiple doses. In fact, I think with the exception of smallpox, almost all are, and we shouldn't be too surprised by this. What's your thought on it? I think that's right. Um, most all vaccines for viruses are like that. Um, and we should not be surprised that you get a better result, therefore, with two doses of J&J &J than just one. I have two grandchildren who got J&J. &J. They're very interested in this discussion right now. I do think it was a noble effort on the part of Johnson & Johnson to do this, because think about the rest of the world, where we still have lots of work to do to get vaccines to people in low- and middle-income countries. It is so much more possible to do that if you have a single dose, and especially one that doesn't require a lot of refrigeration. And that's what Johnson & Johnson was aiming for. And let's be clear, you still get pretty good protection. If the mRNA vaccines had not been so incredibly effective, we'd all be saying, well, Johnson & Johnson, one dose is great. But our standards are now very high because of what the mRNA vaccines have been able to do. Let's talk about this mixing and matching suggestion that is out there, that uh, if you get a second dose of a different vaccine, the efficacy is, is greater. We're not settled on this discussion yet, but there are a lot of people there waiting to get their booster who are saying, well, I want to wait to find out what exactly I should get as my booster. Well, exactly. And this data was discussed on Friday with the FDA's advisory committee. It's NIH data. We ran that study, basically doing a mix and match. You got three vaccines. Uh, let's try every possible combination of what you start with and what you get boosted with and see what happens. And the big, uh, I think, news there was that the mRNA vaccines seem to work really well, boosting everything. And they actually boost Johnson & Johnson better than another Johnson & Johnson dose if you're just measuring antibody levels. Little caveat there, this doesn't actually prove that it gives you higher protection, but it's a pretty good correlate, a pretty good predictor of that. But wait and see. CDC is going to chew on this data uh, this week. Maybe a week from now, we'll have a clear recommendation. If you're somebody who got J&J, &J, like my two grandkids, just wait a week before you decide what is the right thing to do as far as a booster. I think it will become more clear as all that data gets sorted through.
So there are two things to do to fully get rid of this 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 plague, this this pandemic. The one you discussed, and it is the vaccine hesitancy, and we're still trying to figure that out. The other one is the vaccination of children. Um, where do you think we are now in terms of uh, the timeline when, by which all children will be able to be vaccinated? Well, we're closing in on the uh, opportunity for all of the data that Pfizer has submitted to FDA uh, on their vaccine for five to 11 year olds uh, to be publicly reviewed. That's October 26th. This same FDA advisory committee will look at that. We'll see what they say. The data that's been made public by the company looks pretty good. I mean, they tested the vaccine on more than 2,000 kids. This is at one third the dose that you would give an adult. And if you measure the antibody levels uh, in a, an 11 year old, they look really good <laughs> that this one third dose is sufficient. And the safety looks good as well. But let's see what the discussion turns into uh, on October 26th. And then again, remember, we sort of go through this drill each time. First, FDA looks at it. The FDA leadership makes a decision based on that recommendation. Then CDC's advisory committee looks at it. And then the CDC director decides. So we won't have a final answer by Halloween, but it'll be close. Somewhere in the first week of November, we ought to have a pretty good sense of whether this is going to happen. And so kids could be getting injected before Thanksgiving uh, from 5 to 11. Data is out there still being collected on even younger kids, uh, two to four year olds, and even six months uh, to two year olds. But that will be a little later coming along. But if it looks good, probably those age groups also can start getting immunized by early 2022. Dr. Collins, you have been measured and fair and honest uh, in your appearances with us. We appreciate that. You've always agreed to do them. I, I think you probably still got a few months on the job, so I hope you will uh, come back. But I wanted to talk to you today to offer, on behalf of my viewers, our thanks for the service you have performed under some very, very difficult circumstances. Oh, Ali, that's very kind of you. And yes, I'm going to stick it out here till the end of the year or thereabouts. So yeah, I'm glad to come back. As Monty Python would say, I'm not dead yet. So <laughs> if you've got any questions, it. I'll try to provide answers. <laughs> we appreciate that, sir. Dr. Francis Collins is the director of the National Institutes of Health.